by the load he carried on his back and not burdened by the long road in front of him. Because I think deep down inside, he knew that the universe would always provide exactly what he needed whenever he needed it. And you know what? Kilt was right. He saved us. He saved us that night. He taught us. He changed my life. And I am so happy that I met this guy in a kilt, named Kilt, with dreadlocks on the Appalachian Trail. How am I doing on time? Do I have more? Since it was a really short scripture. <laughs> okay. Hearing a bit of the gospel according to Amy, wouldn't you say so? <laughs> My first thought was, I hope I wasn't supposed to do the scripture too. <laughs> when he, I, I don't have anything. That's it. <laughs> so, all right, I'll do one more. <laughs> oh, I got a fan. <laughs> so I used to live in New York City, and I. I went there to act. I wanted to be a legitimate actress, okay? Well, really, I just wanted to sing, dance, and act in musical comedies, but that's what I went there for. And I had this wonderful, tiny little apartment on West 77th Street, and then I got a tour. So, I, is Wynn Irwin here? No. I leased it out to his sister-in-law, sublet it, and went out on the road. And then when I came back from being on the road, I didn't want to kick her out. So I decided, well, I'll find a new apartment. And you know, this is before the internet. Now you just pull up Craigslist and, oh, apartment for rent, duh, done. Back then it was much harder in New York City to find an apartment. So I decided I'll just hang out in the Actors' Equity Lounge with all the unemployed actors, and somebody will know someplace I can you know, land. And so I got a lead on it, and I followed up, and I called this gal. And I think I only asked her three questions. Uh, do you have a room? Uh, how much do you want? And how soon can I move in? And that was the extent of my due diligence. And she said yes, and I said, okay, I'll be there this afternoon. <laughs> so I brought all my stuff, moved in later that day. And so the next morning, I was sitting there having breakfast at my new place. And I think I was having something, what I thought was healthy back then. I think I was having a bowl of sugar pops. <laughs> and in walks my first roommate, Anne. Beautiful gal, red hair, curvaceous, and naked. Okay? And she makes coffee and she sits down and we start chatting. This is the first time I've really gotten to, you know, meet her or see her or know her. Yeah. And I'm thinking, okay, this is a little weird, but you know, it's New York City and I'm in theater. What the heck? Mm -hmm. So then a few minutes later, my other roommate walks in, and Ginny is beautiful blonde, really nice, nice looking gal, naked, gets a cup of coffee, sits down. So now I'm sitting at the kitchen table having breakfast with two naked women. And I'm thinking, what, 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 what? what? That's my brain is going, what, what is this? What is this? What is this? You know? And I finally said, well, you know, girls, why, why are you nude at breakfast? And they said, oh, oh, I guess I forgot to tell you, Amy, we're strippers at the Pussycat Lounge at Wall Street. Oh, you ought to join our club, Amy, they said to me. And I said, oh, no, no, I... Yeah, I came to be an actress. I really thank you, but no, I'll 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 stay unemployed and starving to death. You know, problem. So they would come home nightly, and because really early in the morning, and because my bedroom was right next to the front door of the apartment, they would feel compelled to come in my bedroom and throw thousands of dollars of cash tips on my blue chenille bedspread. 
and wake me up. Oh my God, I wanted to be a stripper in that moment. <laughs> I so wanted to be a stripper. But I kept saying, no, 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 your time will come. And finally, fortune smiled, good fortune smiled upon me. And I was cast in the first national tour of Best Little Whorehouse in Texas with Tommy Toon. And, um, well, kind of like my roommates. Well, they were strippers. I was a hooker. <laughs> and like them, pretty much, well, they didn't wear any clothes, and I had kind of little clothes. And there really, really wasn't much difference between what they did and what I was doing. They got paid nightly in cash, and I got paid weekly by check. They were non-union, and I was union. Oh, but I had health benefits. <laughs> I had health benefits. They didn't have any. So when I saved up enough money, I went and bought a building in Brooklyn for $42,000. <laughs> OK, it was in kind of a bombed out section of Brooklyn. But it was a building, nonetheless. And I'm, I was so excited because you know, I had space. Man, that's all I wanted was space. Give me space. And, you know, we called it edgy, you know. That's what, that's what artists called it. And I didn't live there very long, like two weeks, because, oh, we went out to the 4th, we went out to Fire Island to celebrate over the 4th of July, and I came back and opened the door to my loft, and somebody had chopped a hole in the roof of my building dropped a huge like nautical rope down into the space and taken everything I owned. Well, they left two boxes. They left a box of tax returns and a box of underwear. <laughs> I was devastated. I, I didn't even know what I had anymore because I'm one of those people out of sight, out of mind, I can't remember. And about the same time, my best friend from college, Michigan State University, if there's anybody here, Tom Edwards, came to town because his play, he was a writer, and his play had been optioned by Warner Brothers, and they were going to produce it at the Manhattan Theater Club, which is a very Tony you know, theater on the east side. And so he came to town, and so he was there to kind of cushion the blow when this all happened. And, um, the producers, he was just about to start rehearsals, and the producer called him one morning and said, hey, you know, we love you, Tom. We love your play, but we really don't need you to come to rehearsals. And they do that. You know, they just kind of take your baby and throw you out in the cold. And that was OK, because I got to hang out with Tom. So we'd be wandering around New York, because we had the time to do that. And we'd walk past a window, and I'd see something like, oh. I used to have a Nikon camera, you know, or oh, I used to have a bicycle. And so I decided I'm going to go home. I'm going to take a break. I'm going to go home. And besides that, I had moved back with the strippers, and they had given my room away, and so now I was on the floor with the strippers. And so I... Um, I took my two boxes, because I, I, I didn't have room to keep them, put them in my car, went to pick up Tom on 82nd Street and West End Avenue, went upstairs, knocked on his door, came back downstairs, and somebody had broken into my car and stolen my box of tax returns and my underwear. And I'm not kidding you. And I threw myself on the sidewalk, crying. And Tom didn't know what to do, so he did what he did. He put me on a plane. I went home. When I got home to Grand Rapids, Michigan, I called my best friend from grade school, Ann Matheny. Now, if anybody knows Ann Matheny, Ann Matheny is the kindest, most gentle, she's like a hummingbird. She just is the most gentle, soft-spoken creature. And she also has the largest collection of self-help books of anybody east of the Mississippi. And I figured if anybody could help me figure out what was going on in my life, it would be Ann Matheny. So I called her, told her everything, and she said, Amy, you're in luck. I'm just, I'm just going to go talk to my psychic. 
So I, give me your, she said, I need your date of birth and your hour of birth. I'm going to give that information to you. I'm going to call you this afternoon. We'll get an answer. So she called me that afternoon, and she said, Amy, you are not going to believe what the psychic told me. The psychic told me you're in a seven-year robbing cycle. <laughs> I thought, well, it's OK, because I don't have anything left to rob. I can get past this. And she said, and I got it all on tape, and I'm going to send it to you this afternoon. You've you got to listen to this. She's got some incredible insights. And so I hung up. A couple days went by, nothing. Got nothing. Called her back. I said, Ann, I, I never got the tape. She goes, oh my god, I forgot to call you. I went outside, and somebody had broken into my car, and they stole, they stole not only the tape, but they stole my tape deck, too. I said, oh my god, did she say anything about my loser cooties, like, impermeating the people I know and love? She said, yes. I said, well, what am I going to do? So, so skip like seven years ahead into the future, and I'm here at Fountain Street, and I'm in a class with Julie and Susan. You weren't in it. And it's the Voluntary Simplicity class. How many people have taken that Voluntary Simplicity class? Oh my god, if it ever comes back, take it. We're in the class, and the first question that the course the curriculum asks you to consider is, I'm, I'm going to paraphrase it, but it's something like, when was the time in your life when you felt the freest? And I didn't even have to think about it. I felt the freest when everything was stolen. Of course, after I got through the loss, but I didn't take long to do that you know, progression of loss. That's, that's when I felt the freest. I felt the freest when kilt threw out all this stuff that the experts told me I needed. I felt the freest when I let that hummingbird go from my hand. That's what I learned. So it's something I've known always. But sometimes you need these series of crazy events to happen in your lives so that you're reminded of those things. And so, of course, that you have stories to tell. <laughs> Got to have those events happen. But it's the people. It's the people that come into our lives that teach us everything. They teach us what we must learn. They help us to grow. And I hope that today, maybe you'll turn to the person next to you and take the time to get to know that person. Because that person could be up here <laughs> next time. Or that person might just be your new best friend. And they just might lighten your load on the road of life. And so now we're going to sing that song, if that's OK. <laughs> and this song is for all of my friends, old and new, and those I haven't even met yet. This song is for you. <laughs> 